Hello, hello everyone. I think we're live. Um, let me just double check if we're showing up in the group now. Um, after last week's microphone fail, I thought I would triple check today before we get started. Okay, this is looking good. I can see us. Um, I won't be able to check if you can hear us, but let us know. <laughs> Okay, so welcome to Crush It With Confidence episode six. If you're here live, hashtag live and tell us if you can actually hear us, that would be good. Um, if you're here for the replay, hashtag replay. Um, if you're on right now, um, just remember that you're welcome to ask questions, share your experiences, tell us what you think at any time. Um, even if you're watching the replay, we can always pop back in later on. Um, and continue the conversation. Um, if you're watching this, you know, further down the line on another platform, leave a comment, press the like button and share it with anyone else that needs to hear it. I swear every episode we've had, I thought, oh, there'll be a time when I'm going to share this with somebody else because it's a message that they really need to hear today. So um, feel free to do that. So we're continuing with um, juggling June, as we like to call it. Um, and we're taking the time this month to talk to some inspirational entrepreneurs about juggling all the things that we have to do all the time. And today, um, we are finally approaching the topic of running a business when you have young children, which is um, you know, something that's been on my mind for a little while. So, um, and yeah, for, for that, the first person I thought of that I wanted to talk to was the wonderful Jessica Fernley. So that's why I reached out and I said like, seriously, we've got to come together and, um, and do an interview. So. Jessica is a business coach who specializes in promoting work-life balance alongside business growth. So she helps female entrepreneurs to win back more of their time um, and effortlessly make more money and work better with clients. So the idea is to really reduce people's stress levels, increase their quality of life. So um, that's something that I've been very passionate about for a few months because um, it, otherwise it's just, you know, <laughs> be total chaos at my house. So um, I think we've known each other for well more than a year now. Um, yeah. Time's kind of flown really quickly and in that time she's not only had a baby herself but she's actually helped me to bulletproof my business um for my maternity leave um I'll <laughs> put it in quotation marks um but all of this like it almost seems ages ago now so um with all of that said over to Jessica um would you like to introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit more about what it is that you do how you help people and all that stuff Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, Jess. It's really great to be here. And yeah, it doesn't seem like that long ago, does it, since we were both enormously prego. So <laughs> last year, last year, we I had my second baby, you had your first. And um, when I think when we first met, we were both pregnant, weren't we? And it can just be such a, a crazy time of no energy and loads going on. And you want to get your business sorted and secure, don't you? So you can decide whether you're going to take maternity leave or not. And, yeah, so I have two boys. Um, the eldest is about to turn four and is starting school in September. And the no, youngest, right? Yeah, it's just, where did, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> and the youngest just had his first birthday. So we're kind of, it feels a bit more like we have two toddlers in the house rather than a toddler and a baby. Well, kind of now like a, a slightly bigger boy and, and a slightly smaller toddler. So that's that's exciting and terrifying at the same time. Um, I live in Sheffield in the north of England. Um, my husband is a minister in a church, so he is a very busy man. Um, yeah, so for me, the juggling is just, it's constant because it's between my work, the kids, my husband's job. Oh, yeah, and, you know, life outside. And oh, we're yeah, having fun, life. relaxed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, the, the juggling never really stops. But I think I've found that you can get to a point where you really love everything that you're doing and you can find that time that you need for yourself yeah I think it takes some time right to get into the swing of things and find some kind of way that works and mm. sometimes also let go of perfect um mm. like I've been holding on to having things done a certain way for ages and now I'm like right this doesn't work just forget about it <laughs> let's just do something else and just scrap this so um so you haven't always been um doing what you're doing now um, how did you end up helping other people to build and grow their businesses? What was that kind of journey like? Because I think it's essential to your priorities right now is what, what influenced you in the past. So yeah. I think it'd be good for people to know. Sure. 
Um, so I, I had my first baby back in 2014. And at the time, I was running a startup company. It was a consultancy firm. And we were kind of in the, the six-figure zone, building towards seven figures, which we hit the year after I started maternity leave. Um, and that was, uh, by that time, because I'd already been through burnout, I was working four days a week, not five, because I wanted to have some element of balance. I felt like I was a low-energy person, and I wanted to have a really good quality life. So I'd already learned a few lessons along the way about how to look after myself, how to be the best version of myself. Then I had a baby and like all of that just exploded. <laughs> so I have to say, um, if anyone out there has kind of just had a baby and, or you know has young children and you just think, how will I ever cope having a second or a third or how will I do this again? My experience the second time around was so much easier. Oh my goodness. But the first time it was literally just like this atomic bomb had gone off in my life. And I just felt like, okay, my body is completely different. Like, who, who is this fat person that now inhabits my skin? Um, none of my clothes fitted. I, I literally, I bought all of my feeding tops in size 8 to 10 because I was like, that's the size I was before I was pregnant. And 20 minutes after the baby's born, I'll be back in them. No, that did not happen to me. So, <laughs> so I think it was that kind of identity change of like, I look different. I wear different clothes now. My body needs to do different things. So actually feeding a baby, I'm, I'm so bad at being pregnant and I'm even worse at breastfeeding. I managed four months with my first and actually when I came to have my second baby, even my mum said, oh, you're not going to breastfeed again, are you? <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was something I found it really hard. I was very bad at it. It made us all very stressed and very tired. So, um, yeah, that was something that contributed to that sense of atomic bomb in my life because I was just like, gosh, I feel like I now have this 24-7 job that I just, I'm really bad at. So I, I just felt quite rubbish about how it was all going quite a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, during the course of being on maternity leave, I just felt like I'd taken my life and my identity and sort of put it on pause for nine months. Yeah. And I just felt bored and I felt lonely because like my old life, I had loads of friends. And then my new life, I only had mum friends because they're the ones who are around during the day. And I was way too tired to do anything in the evenings. I was like a zombie. So I just suddenly felt like, oh, now I've got a load of friends that I've only known for five minutes. And the only stuff we really have in common is babies, um, which, you know, it's nice to talk about those things sometimes, isn't it? But sometimes it can be really boring um, just being like, oh, and then I changed his nappy and then this happened. And then, oh, and then he had a nap, but he didn't have the nappy he was supposed to have. And you're like, you know, it was boring when it was happening, let alone talking about it for six hours afterwards. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, having said that, I, I adore my kids and like babies are, it's just, it's, it's indescribable, isn't it? Because it's the hardest, best thing that you ever go through. And like, you love them so much and you look at them and you're just like, look at your little hands and your little face. And you take a photo of every expression they do for like the first year. But then at the same time, it's just, it's so exhausting and it's so monotonous. And I was really, really shocked by that. Yeah. So during that whole phase, cause I, I literally thought, well, I'll, I'll just finish doing my, doing my corporate job because you know, I'm going to be a stay-at-home mum because that's probably what I'll want to do. But then I found myself just being quite bored and frustrated with life as a stay-at-home mum, just as this sort of fat, frumpy, grumpy person. So, And it's the I, same every day, right? It's the same on repeat. You get up, there's a variation of about an hour at my house of what time we're going to be getting up, but we will get up and we'll have a bottle and we'll get changed and we'll have some breakfast and guess what? We're going to have a nap and it's just like it's the same on repeat, rinse and repeat every day and that, that was exactly my feeling. It's like I am actually glad I have something else that I can do apart from thinking about oh, I wonder when the next poop is due. Oh, I wonder if he's going to yeah. sleep on time today. Oh, you know, it was like, oh, I have something else to like occupy my brain. That was yeah. big. Definitely. And I think for me, it was it was sometimes having those days, well, often having those days where you look at the clock and you're like, it's 10.45 in the morning, 19 hours till you next go to sleep. And, you know, you just feel that sense of like, I just don't know. I don't have anything to do with you. You don't talk. And like, I, I don't feel like I can do any of my stuff that I like to do because then you get fussy. And so, you know, I think there was a lot of frustration just about how do I fill the time in a way which is meaningful for, for the baby, um, which bonds us together, which really helps me to feel like I'm using this brain that I have in my head. I'm not just like a ginormous milk machine. And so... <laughs> 
I used to actually walk around the house and just go moo moo because I had <laughs> such problems breastfeeding. Which now, twelve like, nearly twelve months later, it turns out he had a tongue tie, and that flipping mm. meant that he couldn't actually breastfeed properly. I wish somebody told me that like when he was born, but never mind. But I was like walking around the house, expressing milk, feeding the baby on the laptop. I was like, why does this feel like I'm in a zoo? I'm just like moo. <laughs> that was like our joke for like months on end it was just like just go move <laughs> well that's the thing isn't it because it just your body you know it's always been there and you've never quite known what it was for and then suddenly you have a baby and you're like oh wow like you didn't tell me body that you're able to do all these things so it really does it kind of I think it just really changes how you see yourself um but yeah so during that whole phase I was just kind of thinking maybe I would like to go back to work. But then I looked into what it would mean to return to my old job. And it would just mean I didn't get to see my son awake between a Sunday and a Wednesday. And that was working two days a week. And then all of the money that I earned would have gone to paying for childcare that I didn't really want. And so I just kind of, uh, increasingly, I got this feeling of like, I just feel like there has to be a different path for this because staying at home doing no work doesn't feel very appealing. Going back to work feels like the wrong decision for us at the moment. And then I just remember I was talking to a friend and I said, I almost feel like if I just went to, you know, went to work for a local small business, like a sandwich shop or something, and I just used my skills to help them make it the best sandwich shop in the world and really increase their profits and just improve their business. And my friend just said, you know, you really need to just become a business coach. You could totally do that for loads of people. And at the time, that was just I really didn't feel like that would that could ever be me. I just, you know, I felt like that big. Oh, yeah. And I was like, how on earth could I how on earth could I do that? But <laughs> for me, I love my business because it's just been this process of discovering who I am at my core. And I think there are so many things about the work that I do now and the confidence that I have now that I did not have five years ago. And actually it's just amazing. I feel like I've understood my personality in a deeper way than I ever did before. And it's like, oh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. That's that's the problem. That's why I haven't really ever liked corporate. That's why I've always felt quite frustrated in the nine to five. And that's why I've never liked having a boss. I'm made to actually be this quite unique person. And, you know, all the things about myself I thought were weird are actually quite useful when you're an entrepreneur. I don't know if you've found that too, Jess. Yeah, definitely. I'm just thinking I... I had problems like from whenever I took the first job and it wasn't like I, I was at work on time you know I did overtime as and when it was needed I got along with my colleagues just fine but it was always this top-down relationship that really didn't work for me so in my first serious actual job in the industry I stayed in um, I didn't get along with the manager in that place whatsoever and I was always headbutting with the person in charge of the classroom mm. I was in we're now friends like still 10 years down the line and um, so that's kind of lasted but it took us like a year and a half to not argue every day about what needs doing yeah and I was like I felt like I never fit in and so I thought oh maybe it's my job and then I went to the next job and I had the same problem and then I went to the next job and I had the same problem and then the only time it stopped was when I was a manager because I had nobody on top of me telling me what to do <laughs> so I was like okay but then I realized that the owners kind of weren't happy to invest anywhere and they were expecting mm -hmm. all these miracles but where was the money going to come from so I yeah. was like oh hallelujah here we go again so eventually I was like maybe it's not them maybe it's me like I've never even considered it so I thought oh maybe I should just like do my own thing like surely it can't be that difficult yeah. um there's got to be a way right that's why I even looked into it because I always had that problem that I never fit it in right I always felt yeah. like different yeah um, and I never knew where that's come from so yeah, yeah. and it's totally quite amazing isn't it when you actually start your own business and then all of these things that have made it difficult for you to be employed suddenly are really, really helpful. And so I think I had a moment where I just thought, you know, I'm, I never wanted to be a small cog in a big wheel. I want to be the whole wheel. I am the whole wheel. And actually just going at my own pace, I was told in several jobs, you know, you need to work a bit slower because you're going to do yourself out of a job. And I, I just love now that there's nothing like that. You know, I found it frustrating even in school, just there's always everyone around you. And I was one of the clever kids. So I was often towards the front of the, you know, the top of the class anyway, without really trying, which I know is really annoying. And to be fair, um, yeah, I, that isn't necessarily a good thing. That comes to bite you eventually because everyone gets to a point where they're like, oh man, I just failed something because I'm used to never working. And you have to learn. <laughs> I learned at university to work really hard. But um, I think it's that moment of just being like, 
I'm not necessarily in my best environment when I'm put against other people and it's like, oh, so-and-so has been working here for six months as well, so you should go for promotion at the same time. And it's like, nope, I want to go for promotion now. I'm ready. I'm going. So that's what I love about being an entrepreneur now. It's just it feels like I'm finally in an environment where I can work at my own pace, whether that's really fast or really slow. I can just I can make those decisions and those calls myself, and I think I found that so freeing. Yeah, it's. I think it's... It's hard, like when you first realize that you're no longer an employee and you have no longer got anyone like giving you rules, you then also realize that you no longer have anyone giving you guidance. So yeah, that employee mindset is very much like, right, I turn up to work, I have to do eight hours of work and then um, I have an hour's break at some point in between. I'll go home right at that time and that's what I'm going to do. And somebody will tell me what to do. And then I remember my first week after I'd quit my job. So I'm sitting here at my desk and I'm like, Ooh, I'm working for myself. This is amazing. What do I do now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and like, this... oh, I've got a problem. How yeah. how do I fix it? Uh, like, I, I really hated having a boss. And I would always, I think similar to you, Jess, I would always find myself sort of hitting up against that authority figure. But then suddenly when they weren't there, I really missed them because I realized that any time I had a problem, I could just be like, oh, I don't have to think about this. I'll just leave it on their desk. Whereas yeah. suddenly you're like, huh, what are we going to do about that? Yeah. I don't um, know. <laughs> it's, and that, that's exactly it so in a way that's like something hard to realize but I found on the flip side there you have all the power right so if you don't like the way something's working or it's not working at all and you know it's not working you can just fix it like whenever you run into an issue no problem you can just call the shots and you can say hey that tool is spitting out you know wrong timesheets Let's just go, scrap it, and just use another one. You don't have to go to your boss who has to go to their boss, who has to wait for the yeah. budget, who has to, you know, and suddenly you have this onward chain for, like, a simple decision. And mm. you know that chain won't, you know, that, that decision won't get made until, like, Christmas just because that's how long mm. it takes. And you're like, come on. Now, who cares? It's like you don't like it. You can change it. That's yeah, like and my that's favorite. such a powerful thing, isn't it? And that's one of the things that I totally love as well. I think... um. It, it, the challenge that comes with it is that you have to learn to trust your own gut instinct yeah. and you have to learn to make your own decisions. And certainly for me, when I was in corporate, I always felt like there was a manager there being like, you can't say that. You can't do that. No, you shouldn't do it that way. You need to do what I'm telling you. And so actually training yourself out of that mindset of like, I, I can't be trusted to do this. Like my boss always says that I'm doing this wrong and actually being like, okay, so let's do what we think is right. And if I do it wrong, I'll learn. And I think I've actually just found that I've stopped second guessing myself in, in the way that I used to. It's probably always going to be something that I struggle with a little bit, but it's, it's just, you know, almost you're expecting someone to be like, you know, you really can't do this. You, you're really not allowed to do this. And you look around and you're like, there's no one there to say that. So I guess I can do this. So off we go. Oh, Jess, I've lost your sound. Oh, can you hear on, me? There we go. Oh, you're back. Hooray. I coughed and I turned the microphone off, so it must have not turned off. <laughs> so I, I love being able to just um, to just make that change and then just roll with it. And at the end of the day, I know that a lot of us are really afraid of judgment, um, other people actually judging them negatively for what they're doing. But at the end of the day, as long as you do what's you, mm. people don't actually care. People care if somebody that's super quiet naturally and mm. that has a very distinct way of speaking and doing things then suddenly pretends to be this entirely opposite thing mm. and that looks completely wrong it sounds wrong and it comes across the wrong way and then people judge mm. and w simply in the other way around it works too if you're normally really outgoing and then you're trying to pretend to be like this little shy thing that sort of is trying to sneak some sales tactic in there it never works because people see through that and they go well you know that person is just making it up like that's not who yeah. they are and it's very obvious so as long as you do whatever works for you in the way yeah. that it works you know you'll probably yeah. be just fine doing it I think that's... I think it's also it's it's learning to almost like turn the volume down so when when you first start your business um I found it was so hard to just be visible and step out there and say this is what I'm doing and people might criticize me for it or people might look at it and be like, who are you to do that? But I think I just, you get used to just drowning out those sounds and being like, actually, I've decided I'm going to take this course of action. And if someone goes, actually, I think that's a really bad idea. You shouldn't do that. You just go, okay, yeah, thank you. No, that's really helpful. 
ignore. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's all part of building that confidence, isn't it? As a person, you don't need people's permission to do your business a certain way. And I certainly found that with something as a new mum, I, I constantly felt like I needed people's permission to decide to stop breastfeeding, to decide when to start solid foods with my son, um, whether to give cow pole or would that be really bad? And like, you're not supposed to do that. You know, everything. Is he too hot? Is he too cold? Is he wearing the wrong clothes? What if I put him in a really thick sleeping bag and then he's got pajamas on underneath and what will happen? Like, I just got used to just saying to people, okay, so you might really disagree with that decision. Like, you know, stuff like breastfeeding, it gets really heated, doesn't it? And people feel really passionately about it. Try telling your health visitor that you stop breastfeeding and see what happens. Um, but I was, I was terrified. <laughs> Exactly. And I remember that I went to the weighing clinic with um, my first son when he was a baby and I, I fed him from a, a bottle of ready-made formula and I poured it out in there and I was just like, I feel like everyone's looking at me. But actually, you just learn that it doesn't matter what people think. If you're, if you're using your, your best ability to be a good mum to your, to your kids, then actually that's the most important thing. And you might have other people's blessing, you might not. But actually, it, it's just so much more important to make a good decision and feel confident in that decision. So certainly for me, there's been things that I've had to learn as a mum that I've also had to learn in my business. And I've sort of been doing the two at the same time. But it's really helpful when you can just be like, huh, yeah, I've actually grown in that area. I think, I I don't know, I used to just say, hey, you know what? It's like, everybody, let's just grow a pair of balls right now. <laughs> I was like, just go out there and just be like, hey, I don't care. So I went to the dietitian last week and they were like, oh, you did not get your child weighed since December and your child was born very small. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I didn't get them weighed. That's right. Do you want to put him on the scales now? Like, you know, you, after yeah. after some time, you just learn to stand up to people. At the end of the day, I think they, they have a job somebody else has a job and they, they're just trying to do the best that they can and it might not be right for you but just mm. take it and leave it like oh, yeah that doesn't have that. to be like the defining thing about your identity or your behavior no. I remember when my second son was born I had a voicemail on my phone from the breastfeeding service locally and they just said oh hello we're phoning up to see how breastfeeding is going we'd like to talk to you about it and I was like I'm just not going to call you back because I've had a baby before, I've been bad at breastfeeding before, I'm bad at it now. I know what I can try, I know who I'm going to talk to when I need help. I don't know you and I'm not accountable to you actually. And it's it's just very subtle shifts, but I think I would have called them back with my first son and then cried after the phone call and been like, they think I'm a terrible parent. But it's just learning to be like, well actually, I, I get what, why you're there and thank you for letting me know that you're there so that I can call you if I need to. But I don't know who you are, and you may be yeah. right to tell me what to do. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, we just got to say congratulations to April, because April said she's expecting her first in September. So, um, yeah, that would be exciting for you. Sorry, I'm, I, it cut out for a minute, so oh. I missed a little bit. I said um, we need to say congratulations to April because April said she's expecting her first in September. So, oh, um, congratulations. So yeah. exciting. I know, it really is. Come to the dark side. We've got cookies and a load of other stuff, usually behind the <laughs> cushions. So, um, so let's talk about isolation. So I get what you're saying about like this whole mum thing. And I found that I've taken, I've taken Jack to play group a few times and I'd go there and I'm sitting down and I put him down and he's playing with his toys and I'm trying to talk to all the other mums mm -hmm. and there's just like no conversation because everyone's like, how old is your little one? So that, that's like the elevator pitch of mum groups, right? Oh, yeah. he's very cute. How old is your little one? And I'm like, here we go again. That same old conversation. I'm like, well, this old and your one, well, this old, mm. And then they go, oh, he's very big for his age. Or, oh, he's not very big for his age. And then you go, oh, no. Why are you saying that about is, the child? Is he crawling yet? You know, <laughs> how's this? And you're just like, why do they always have to make the one thing that my child doesn't do? They have to ask <laughs> about it. Right? So, but, you know, that, that conversation, it just never goes off the ground. And then I, I was watching people for some time. And I realized that a lot of the other mums are all talking to each other. And they're all connecting um you know, they're all connecting over their babies and what amazing things their babies are doing. 
And I feel like I'm out of place for two reasons. The first one is that I have a degree in early years and I've actually looked at babies for 10 years. No, your baby is not particularly clever because they're clapping at eight months. That's Never know, say that to someone months. though because it's like their little <laughs> accolade, isn't it? And they're oh, so right. proud of it. So I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like my, my 18 month old is counting. No, she's repeating numbers in the correct order that they've memorized. They're not counting. Yeah, that's true. You know, so I'm just like, oh, so I'm out of place for that reason. Reason, but I'm also out of place because I have something other than a baby mm. and there's just, there's just no conversations and I know yeah. that this sometimes this can feel very isolating if you do want to go the plague route, route because there's just nobody that understands you like if they're at plague mm -hmm. group they're not at work they don't have that responsibility so what what would you say is your top tip like from a business perspective because you're working mm. from home and you've got the baby how do you unisolate yourself I think you have to work really hard actually to to make that common ground with people even if you don't find it easy and I have to say I, I often find it the same so I've chosen not to go to sort of baby groups with my with my second because just when I went with my first I felt like people, you know, would be like, oh, you're pregnant again. And I'd be like, <laughs> no, I'm just really fat. <laughs> so I just, I think for me, I just, I felt like I didn't want to go to something where the only thing that we have in common is the fact that we have kids, because I, I think that can just be quite boring when you're already slightly under stimulated. And sometimes it's also realizing that you just, you need that, you need friendship, you need adult conversation. I often find myself if I've not like been out and seen friends enough when I do see them I'm just like chat 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 and it's like <laughs> calm down but it's like I'm just so excited to be having a conversation with another adult so the way I structure my week at the moment is I have um I have groups that I do with my boys on a Tuesday and a Thursday so I feel like I'm getting good quality time with them in fact now I think about it the group that I go to on a Tuesday there's a crash which I put them in so it's not technically time with them but it's time <laughs> with my friends <laughs> exactly and that that group is a really big support that's brilliant and then we have a lovely music group that we go to on a Thursday and that is all together um, and there are friends at that as well who live locally and so we bump into each other quite a lot and it can be it can be good but I'm quite an introvert naturally um, and so I do often find that just being in that crowded environment with, you know, one child tugging on my arm, being like, come on, stop talking, come and play with me, I need a wee. And then the other one being like, I'm sweet, I need a nap, where's my milk, I'm sweet. You know, and then you're like, um, sorry, what were you saying? And then their <laughs> kids, you know, sets off. So it's really hard to have that, like, decent conversation. Yeah. So I think almost, like, be, be aware of yourself and how you are feeling. Um, so... I don't know if you've ever played the games Sims where you, you know you're you're like God. Yeah, and you I have used to love it. Sims. Yeah, me too. I think that says something about our personality. <laughs> just, but, um, I, I used to just build the houses though and put the furniture in it. I didn't like the playing of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. But like all of the Sims as people, they have like these little meters for how they're doing. So if they're tired, their meter is running low, and you need to help them fill it up. And they have one for social and hunger, and like almost remember that as a person, you have these categories as well. You have yeah. needs. And like know the signs. So if you just think, actually, I feel like I haven't spoken to another adult for ages and I haven't seen a friend and I haven't done anything spontaneous for a really long time. Don't wait until that meter's on red and you feel like you're just desperate to do something. Just top it up every every once in a while, every every week, every day, if need be. Try and always do something which yeah. really charges your batteries so that you feel like I am making even, it, you know, it's slow progress, isn't it? Making new friends when you're in this stage of life. We have both relocated to a new part of the country yeah. in the last 12 months, haven't we, Jess? So sometimes you have to be the person who does all the legwork to get to know other people because when you arrive, they've all done NCT together. They've been to baby groups together. And so you're parachuting in at a later stage. Yeah. And someone said that to me recently, like, just don't be afraid to be the person who makes the effort and to always texts around everyone and says, do you want to do this? Do you want to go to the park? Do you want to ditch the kids here and go for coffee? You know, even going out in the evenings, just remember who you are as a person. Remember that you have needs as well and don't make it all about the kids so that you're just completely like struggling and feeling like, oh, I just, I don't feel like I can go to that group because I just don't have it in me to talk about all this stuff without really having a meltdown. Because I think sometimes when children are demanding all the time it's just really exhausting and you know I've had times 
it's quite funny actually at the music group that I go to most of the mums there have had one week where they just burst into tears and you know sometimes you just need to be like that kid just hit my kid and made him cry and like it's just been the last straw it's just been a difficult week it's been a difficult day I just it's too much and so just having people around you who you can have those conversations with I think is really helpful yeah and I think it's like you said like moving to a new area it's quite like it's quite tricky because I can't just meet up with the people that I've already made relationships with and um yeah and then it's it's hard to like even come across other people so it's kind of like you're in this thing if I don't go to the baby group right then I won't meet anyone else but the people that hang at baby group are not exactly my people so <laughs> it's like finding other ways and actually um it probably goes in line with um getting used to people saying no I think the best skill that you can learn for your business is to be okay with somebody saying no I'm not interested um mm. and it's the same like if you go out there and you practice making relationships with people it doesn't mm. matter if that's in person if that's to do with the kids or whatever or if it's um for your business it's the same thing right business thrives off relationships the more people you can meet and get to know and speak to make connections with the more likely things are to happen and if you practice that in person where there's very little you know it's just about do you want to meet up and like go for a coffee and what's the worst thing that person can say they can say oh well no I'm, I'm really a bit busy mm. okay yeah exactly and it's it's knowing kind of whether the risk of doing that will outweigh the benefit of ending up friends with that person yeah. even if because I think sometimes you can feel a bit like oh I'm I'm always the one who texts and says do you want to meet up but actually if you need the friendship more than they do right now like yeah that's what that's what you have to do and yeah. it, you know just suck it up and do it because the benefit of having that friendship is even more I think as well the isolation that you get with a baby when it's just you and the baby is quite unique so as my elder son has got older so now he's nearly four he's actually pretty good company right now um he's quite fun and he chats all the time so he's like mummy why does she eat grass mummy what is that mummy why does that smell like that mummy and so it's just it it doesn't it's not the same as when it's like with a baby who just fusses all day and you just feel a bit like there's just nothing to do so I think it does get easier and I, I've found having a second is completely different because there's not that much time where it is just me and the baby but then my second is such a different personality to my first um, and he's a lot more person focused he really wants your attention he wants eye contact he wants to be held whereas It's my first wasn't really like that your head and be like and be like look at me and you're like yeah okay I'm looking <laughs> it's like yeah um, so at the moment Toby my younger boy he always wants to put his fingers in our mouth and like get our teeth And they just say, I don't want to play dentist, actually. No, It's not no, actually that you. much fun going to the dentist, let alone having you do it, too. No, thank no, you. No, thank you. <laughs> But he just, he loves it. And, you know, I think, so find the things that are really sort of recharging for you, even in your current situation. So, you know, if there's something that your child really loves and you can really do together and bond, that will really help build that kind of general sense of yeah. positivity between you. And if you just need to get out the house and the baby's crying... <laughs> Just take the baby out of the house, whether the baby is crying or not. So my, my baby persistently cried for mm. about four months. Um, yeah. And if I'd stayed home the entire time, actually, a baby crying is much easier out of the house than it is inside the house because inside it the is. house, it tends to kind of echo. Um, yeah. The best thing is outside on a rainy day because you get to put the rain cover on the pram as well. So it That actually the dampens sound the sound set. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you, sometimes all you can do is just go like, you know, it's, it's not you. <laughs> mm. It's the baby and you just got to make do with the situation that you have right now. Like, yeah, I've had times where like, I mean, I, I didn't really stop working as such. So I was supposed to have a podcast interview. No, a summit interview on the day I gave birth. So I debated at 6 <laughs> yeah. a.m. whether I could make the 11 a.m. interview or whether the baby would come before I love that. then. I was like, could I That's still so squeeze funny. the interview in? And then it turned out that, you know, this baby was going to make an appearance fairly quickly. So I was like, oh, I better get someone to tell that person that I can't come to their interview because I'm unfortunately going to have the baby right now. And then <laughs> I, I was arguing with them at the hospital the next day because I had stuff to do and I wanted to go home. 
and they wouldn't let me get her home that afternoon and then they took forever the next day so I remember having a rant at the midwife and I was like excuse me do you understand that I run my own business and I've actually got other things to do other than hanging in hospital and waiting for you to sign a piece of paper to let me go home like there was nothing to do and I didn't have my laptop and I was just sitting there the baby was sleeping the entire day he didn't wake up to feed like and even if you did wake him up he didn't want anything anyways so I, I've just let him sleep and I was like I've been sitting here for like five hours this baby's sleeping like hello <laughs> so I've had that from, from day one I wanted to do as much as I as much as I can but then I had to be realistic I was like right I can't have calls if the baby's like screaming his head off so I need to make another plan I can't do this I can't do that right now at this time so it's about adjusting things I guess and there's something that I found that you've done that's really interesting and that's shifting more from one-to-one -one work to having like a group program and um, when did you decide to put that in place and how did you find that entire experience like with baby after baby was there and you know yeah well it's really interesting actually because I I'd been asking my community you know what what kind of service would you like and particularly I had a couple of really engaged people who hadn't bought from me and I was a bit like you know you say that you love all my stuff and you're there with everything that I do like why aren't you buying <laughs> and you know I was actually thinking like seriously I'm gonna have to like kick you out of the group because you're giving me lots of like boosts in terms of my ego but it's not helping my business at all um and actually the thing that people start to say is like can you do like a monthly membership like subscription type group and at the time I was like oh are you kidding like I just really didn't find that appealing and I felt <laughs> like oh I just I don't want to do like a group program like some of the ones that I've been in where people are just kind of drifting in and drifting out and no one's really engaged and the person running the program isn't really engaged either because they really they're not being paid enough to make it worth their while to be in the group and so because I guess I'm an entrepreneur and I just think well if I don't like the premise of this then I change the premise so yeah. I was like well what if I took like a one-to-one -one offer and a group program and sort of merge them together um so out of that my mastermind program was born and it really suited me because I wanted to be able to um, know that I was having income coming in without having to do heavy marketing every month for one-to-one -one clients um, I also wanted to get the most out of the time that I had available so having like a group call um, where we all focused our attention and then even taking on one-to-one -one hours outside of that it was all kind of part of the same thing and I could be in control of every month what was getting booked up and just know that I didn't have to do a load of sales calls because actually my income was guaranteed for the six months of the program. Yeah. So it, I kind of, um, I was piloting it anyway in the early stages of my pregnancy. And I, I was doing some one-to-one -one work offline at that time as well. But then because I get morning sickness so badly, I was just like, I, I don't really want to take on any more one-to-one -one clients offline. I just can't really do face-to-face -face at the moment. So usually I found however bad I was feeling, I could hold it together for like an hour and then go and be sick afterwards, or, or go and, you know, feel faint and lie on the sofa and go, oh, I just feel so ill. <laughs> but it was really important <laughs> for me to kind of find something which enabled me to almost sweep aside all of the pregnancy stuff and just say, I can be my normal, you know, my healthy self. I can, I can hold it together for an hour or two hours to do this call, and then I'll re resume my pregnant life after that. And I think yeah. for me, compartments in life always seem to help I think you can overdo them but I think just having something where I say right work is going to be my protected time where actually the stuff going on outside work isn't going to encroach on that yeah. um, so that was a really that was a really helpful thing and it just I think as as I did the mastermind so I've, I just launched it for the fourth time in April and I ran it twice last year because um, it's a six-month program I think as as I ran it each subsequent time it just felt like it was it was growing more and it was more fun and I sort of I started to find things about it that I really, really loved. So it was almost a big surprise. And everyone always says, don't they? Like, ask your community what they want. And yeah. guess what? It's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, no, you were right as well. Come on. <laughs> but that, that's the thing, though. It's like sometimes we are so stuck in thinking what we should be offering people. And then we forget to actually ask in turn, hey, what do you think of this idea? And and we also have to remember that when we do ask people and they say, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Sometimes it comes around to buying time. Yeah. 
and they've decided that actually they weren't all that impressed with the idea so that they're not going to vote with their credit card they're, they're, they're just going to vote and say yes for someone yeah. else so um, that's something to also bear in mind so if we're thinking like taking April as an example so baby's coming in September that's okay. like now three months away a little bit less than that we're mm-hmm. getting close <laughs> so it's like eek um, what would you think were the were kind of the key things that you would think somebody would need to do to get their business ready for having baby arrive? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, think about think about your business as a whole. Think about your business model. Is it going to be something which is sustainable on no sleep? And I always say to people, plan for the absolute worst extreme because I actually found I, so I went back to work three weeks after my second son was born. Um, I have to be honest, going in Facebook groups at that point, I did burst into tears once because it was just a bit too overwhelming because it's, it's funny, like sometimes you feel completely normal when you've had a baby and other times you just feel incredibly hormonal, incredibly yeah, vulnerable. Yeah, it's just your hormones, like it's unpredictable, yeah. right? Like people stop talking to you properly. They're, they're just like, I'm just not going to say anything dodgy just because I don't know. Like, <laughs> Well, exactly. And I think after... Even after my second son was born, I had quite a complicated um, labor. I had a very bad tear. I had to go to surgery. Um, apart from that, it all happened in the last second of labor. Apart from that, it was such a good labor experience. And I was like, yes, this one's going to be a good one. And it just went completely wrong. Literally in the last second, he just came out way too fast. Major tear, really bad. Um, so it did take me a while. It took me a little bit longer, I think, to recover and I just remember for the first three weeks, definitely the first two weeks after he was born, I just, you know, that jet lag feeling where you're not really sure if you're awake and, or if you're dreaming. I felt really out of it. And I, I remember someone came to visit and I was like, I know that she's here. I know that she's sitting here, but I feel super woozy. Yeah. I just, I don't know if she's actually here. I don't think I'm imagining it, but I just had that slightly surreal feeling. Um, so if, if you feel like that when your baby is born, Imagine how hard it's going to be trying to do your normal stuff 100%. Yeah. Um, so try and scale down, if you can, what your business model is. Try and take the absolute minimum hours that you can think of working and get the maximum profit out of them. So for me, that was turning my one-to-one offer into like a hybrid mastermind group where I, I had fixed income for six months because yeah. people paid a monthly amount. Um, I, I was only committed to, I think I was working six hours a month for most of last year, which was literally contact time with people in the group. Um, make sure that you just, everything is manageable. And it sounds, it can sound quite like, oh, you know, I don't want to cut my business down. I actually earned more last year than I did the year before in my business when I was working really hard, like 15 hour days sometimes, three days a week. And so I think a lot of that is because I put in a lot of foundation work mm. the previous year, but my business is more profitable and I worked absolutely tons less and that meant saying no to a lot of things. There were loads of things that I'm doing in my business now that I really wanted to do last year, but it just yeah. meant being disciplined and saying, that's not the time to do that, actually. And that also goes for outgoing. So the thing that I did in the very early stages of my mastermind, I wanted a profitable business model. So it wasn't enough to just be like, well, my income you know, is going to be fixed at this level. And so actually, I wanted to look at my outgoings and make sure that I knew that I was making a profit every month. So that the profit over the year would build up instead of just being like, wow, I'm I'm spending 110% of what I'm earning every yeah. month. Because that's a stressful place to be in and that doesn't help you when you've got a baby. I just I wanted to give myself an absolute kind of clear run to take the whole year off if I wanted to. I didn't know if I'd get postnatal depression. I didn't know if I'd just be a complete wreck afterwards or just find coping with two at home really, really exhausting. So I wanted to plan for the worst case scenario almost. So I gave myself as much leeway because it's really hard when you're struggling physically and emotionally after having a baby and you also have that big pressure of like I've got to keep my business going we need money we need and you know sometimes that's unavoidable because that's the reality of having a business but I think you can you can make things easy for yourself by just expecting that you will feel really shattered and you won't really want to do anything because then if you do it's an absolute bonus but then if you don't you're not kind of being like, oh no, I've sort of anticipated that I'll be able to work four days a week and I just can't. And that, that I think helped me an awful lot because um, I, I mean, I didn't feel like I had so much of the problem, but I'm like this baby, I'm like, I don't even know whose baby this is. Like, come on, like nobody in our house is that on edge. So as much as I felt fine and I felt ready to work, my baby 
chooses to get up um, mm. a lot still. Well, he was just such a terrible, terrible sleeper, wasn't he, for like... Ages. Really? I mean, he had about like 10 the, months. The, 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 I mean, yeah, he's 10 months now and he's still not sleeping. I'm still up twice in the night. Like, realistically, I never get more than three to four hours of sleep in one piece. So, mm. and that's not for lack of trying, you know. Everyone yeah. will come out and be like, have you, have, you, have you read this book? Have you tried this system? Just like, trust me, I've tried it all. Even the dying sleep consultants quit on us. So, like, <laughs> my child will not sleep. So, what can you do? I couldn't predict that. I couldn't know that. So, in a way. And you can't control that. You can't make decisions no. about what kind of baby you get because it is literally luck of the draw. My first was really hard work. My second is an absolute easy dream. Yeah. Like, no one in any of our families is as easygoing and happy as he is. We don't know why he's like that, but it's complete luck of the draw. And I did, you don't really know as well until you have your second whether your first was easy or very complicated. And I think it's having a second who's easy has made me realize that it was very hard the first mm. time around for us. I just think it's like you just got to bear in mind that you might want to do all the things, but the problem is that the baby might not want to do all the things. So we ended up in a position where... The first two weeks, I thought, this is easy. If he continues like this, this is going to be a dream. Because he slept Lovely, and, slept and slept and yeah. slept and slept. But the thing is, he was also born two weeks early. And I swear, on the day he was supposed to be born, this child woke up. Like, And he's he's never gone back to that nice, lovely state where he slept so much. Like, I was like, maybe next week he'll start doing this again. No, he won't. So and the thing is that what helped me is bearing in mind that, okay, I can't change this. So I have to just run with it now so if he wakes up every three hours at night as a newborn should fair enough um he's going to be awake for about an hour and then he's going to go back to sleep so i'm going to be awake for an hour i'm going to work for an hour um while he hangs around and just you know looks at his things mm -hmm. i have a quick chat with him and then i work for a bit and then he'll go back to sleep and i'll go to sleep and then when he wakes up i'll play with him for a bit we feed then he's gonna lie around and look at his stuff and i'm gonna go and work for a bit so i just worked for some time in between every sleep so i gave up mm. on working hours as such if it meant yeah. i'd be working at midnight and 4 a.m i'd be working at midnight and 4 a.m it didn't matter i just had to get the things done and i felt better knowing that i could have as many naps in the day as i want to if i need to sleep so yeah that worked for some time and then um and then things change and they change every couple of weeks right so you just have a system that works you have a routine and then the baby goes no no we don't like that routine anymore i'm gonna change it up a bit so you have to yeah. go and you have to review everything all the time so i expected the worst i handed out all of the work so i didn't have to do anything mm. and that was the best decision ever if i hadn't done that I would have majorly lost the majority of my clients. Like I mm. eventually ended up losing the ones that I did keep because like he just he just became so difficult that he was waking at some point every 45 minutes all night long. Yeah. And nobody will survive on that. You cannot remember anything. You you're just not you. Like you yeah. you're not you when you're tired. <laughs> it's like and, But that's the thing, Jess, I think you had a really extreme experience because I remember when you first told me what Jack was doing overnight, I actually <laughs> couldn't quite believe it. Yeah. And you're just like how are you even conscious? Because I think just the tiredness of having a baby, like I'd heard loads of people talk about sleepless nights and I didn't really ever realise no, that no. you would have some <laughs> nights where you spent zero time sleep. That was a real shock to me. And then you're just expected to do like a sort of full 12 hour day with the baby afterwards. And it's like, OK, wow, I feel like I'm aging quite rapidly through this whole process. Yeah. So but, um, I feel like we're not really selling this here. <laughs> but I think the thing is, because you were prepared, you had a plan and you had a plan for your business, didn't you? So um, and, and that's that's exactly what I think you should do. Like use the chunks of time that present themselves during the day. If you want to equally, if you want to have a bath on your own, if you want to like have a lie down, be prepared to work or not throughout the day and just take like a let's see what happens approach and see what you can do. Because I've actually found I really enjoyed um, having work ongoing. So three weeks after Toby was born, I think I did my first Facebook Live. And I look back at it now and I just think, how on earth did I do that? But actually <laughs> at the time, it just felt like I switched on my old brain and I was like, here I am. And I didn't have that kind of awful like who – you know what happened to my life and these are the things that I'm good at and that I enjoy so like why why have I stopped doing all of those things it felt quite nice to have that consistency with like okay so I had a baby yesterday that was Monday 
today is Friday and like life goes on and just have that continuity between life before and life afterwards. I think it is kind of a bit of a shocking thing that 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 disruption to everything that you're used to I am still not over it so I still have tantrums when the baby just will not play on his own because I have this thing that I'm just highly excited about right now that I just can't do I'm like oh Mm. you know I I just want to have a tantrum with the baby now because I'm literally at the point where I'm like hey like I would like to look at this because this is an exciting new tech tool do you understand this so, and then I'm like, I can't, I have to put this on hold until later. Later, there's something that I have actually pre-scheduled that I'm going to have to do. So it's that, it's that rapid change from you being in charge of what you're wanting to do to yeah. someone else being completely in charge of it. And I, I love that's, this That's a massive frustration, isn't yeah. it, though? And I, I felt that so much last year because you're just like, I want to be spending my day doing these things, but instead... We have to watch nursery rhymes for three hours because you will not sleep because you're teething and you're a really grumpy little baby today. And it's just always that slight feeling of like, I I want to be doing this, but I have to do this. And it's this duty. And I think when you can start to blend the two a little bit more, then it does feel a lot better. I think there's always a point, whatever age it comes, where they just click in a little bit more. And we get better at managing our own expectations. Because I think when you're like, when you're, when you're the personality that I think you and me both are, Jess, when <laughs> you're very fiercely independent and you're used to being autonomous, suddenly having this little dictator who tells you what your day and your night is going to be like, that's very hard for people like us, I think, to cope with. Yeah, I keep saying I, I'm going to my day job because the boss baby is calling. So it feels exactly. like you're back at work because somebody else is constantly telling you what to do with your time. So I'm like, I just got out of this. Like, why again did I end up in this situation? But it's funny because even Natasha says even my four-year-old still determines how much I can do because she's been really blessed with having the flu going around and then getting some diarrhea to go with that. So it doesn't matter even if you have daycare if you can't send your child. So yeah, it's like that's so frustrating. And I, I want to say something about um getting other people to look after your children so Mm. my sanity savior literally that minute was the first person i got to look after the baby and he was shock horror six weeks old because i had a baby that like i said screamed for i mean it turned out in the end that he did have a food intolerance which is why he was screaming so much and so uncomfortable but um, until that is worked out with the doctors, there's nothing you can do. You're just dealing with it every day. So mm. he just liked being held, preferably while you're standing up. And that is it. And you are doing that for 18 out of 24 hours. Like that's mm. literally what it was like for some of the days. So mm. I needed some help to not go completely do lally. So I luckily had work to focus on to stop me from thinking so much about Mm. how much I hate this situation right now Mm. because there's nothing you can do you have the small person screaming at you and nothing you do fixes it Mm. that is exhausting I used to put the big noise cancelling headphones on while I held the baby just because I had this headache that would not go yeah and you find that when you're in the shower or when you're going to sleep at night you can still hear the crying even though it's stopped and it's almost like a sort of traumatic thing isn't it because it it makes even if you're calm about it it does make you really stressed like your heart pounds when your baby cries yeah that we're genetically predispositioned for that to happen when it's your own child so that that's like but even newborns are like that even in a supermarket if i if you hear a newborn crying you go the baby's crying like yeah it makes you look around doesn't it Huh? And if you're still breastfeeding, then you get your let down. You're like, oh, gosh, and why like, is that? Oh. It's like, <laughs> just soaked. So these are just all those like really weird moments. But I, I had to get some help and I got someone to come in for like four hours, five hours, twice a week. Um, then we moved house and then I get, got someone to come in for two days for like seven hours. Now mm. I'm looking, he's 10 months now. I'm now looking at the possibility of getting some kind of full-time daycare in place. And the thing is, what, what was important for me is that it's a choice. I'm making a choice to get help. I'm not forced into returning to my work and having to leave my child when I'm not ready. So if you feel like you need to get some help, I think it's really important that you do. Um, I had to do it just to stop people from getting hurt, like honestly. And that, that was probably going to be myself. I'd thought quite a few times I could just put the baby down and just jump out the window. Like it, yeah. it just makes you go crazy it when you have you days like places, that. places, doesn't it? When it's just because it's the responsibility that I'd never felt before of like, I can't just phone someone else and be like, can you just do this? Because you're the mum. And like often even even the, the baby's father they don't have that responsibility on them in the early days that that you feel. I found that a complete shock. But I think everything that you're saying is completely true because 
I I had a, a kind of ideal about you know my children will not go to nursery before I I went on maternity leave. I just I was dead set against it. So then it was quite a shock to me when my first son was one and I'd started doing my business and I was ready to start saying right okay let's let's try and do this for a couple of days a week and see what happens. Um, it was it was quite a, a sort of come down for me to just be like oh I have to get off my high horse now because he's actually starting nursery. <laughs> so, and I. I just, I actually loved that. And so with um, my second son, he started nursery at five months old because that was basically the point at which he wanted to be the center of attention when I had a client on, on Skype. And so yeah. he would cry. <laughs> and you know, as soon as I finished the call, he'd be like, hello. And I'd be like, oh. And you, you can't have a baby crying like that when you're, when you're, people are paying to work with you. It's, no. it's not the professional image that I wanted to put across. So my second son started nursery at five months old. Um, I, I've always left both of them. So we go to church and there's a crash on a Sunday. I've always left them in the crash from like two weeks old because there are people there who love babies, who are very good at babies. I get to cuddle them all day, every day, and most of the night often. I'm fine to just have an hour or two off. So little yeah. things like that. Find a friend who, you know, might have grown up children who is just desperate to look after a baby. I've, I've left both of them with trusted and responsible friends, but without me. From quite a young age yeah. so when my first son was little we lived really close to my in-laws because we still lived down south and um, they used to have him I think from the age of about four months for a day at a time and that was just it was one day a week and it was really helpful for just giving me that bit of space but also getting him used to the fact that there are other people who can be really fun to be with and it doesn't always have to be mommy yeah I think that's something that it's changed a lot, right? Because like, if you go back 50 years, there wouldn't have just been one person looking after looking after the baby, right? You would have been staying with your family and there would have been from day one, aunties and uncles and nannies and granddads. There would have been all these people around you and now we live in a very isolated way and you can't just, I have nobody I can just leave the baby with realistically. So um, for me, there was no option but to get someone to help me. Um, yeah. and it's helped me as far as the business goes. It's helped me on a personal level. And I think it's helped him because yeah. even now when, when Anani arrives, I can just go and leave him. I don't have to worry about him. Like yeah. he's happy. He's excited to see her and that's it. So I mean, like I've tried from the beginning to like, not be too, yeah. you know, not have him too glued to me all the time. And well, I think sometimes it can be a trust thing. And even, even with the baby's father, um, some mums can find themselves just being like, I can't trust you with the baby. And I think that is understandable. That's a really strong instinct that we have. But yeah. I think it's always good to involve other people in looking after your child if yeah. you can. Because you've got to be able to trust your partner with them. Because otherwise, you're going to be doing 100% of everything day and night for the next however long. Yeah. Um, and that's not sustainable for the long term. And it, it builds a rift in your relationship as well. So I've always tried really hard to have a co-parenting situation with my husband. To the point that actually now... Often in the mornings, he gets up first, then he gets the boys up and gives them breakfast. And I, I feel quite guilty sometimes because I'm just like, <laughs> wow, I'm just like this lazy person. I get to, you know, get up a little bit after them, have my shower, get ready, come down. And then he takes the kids to nursery if it's a nursery day or I take them out to the groups if it's not. And then, you know, it's, it's almost for me, it's been dealing with the fact that actually now we do have an arrangement that works quite well. That it's taken us several years to perfect. But um, it's, it's feeling that guilt of like, shouldn't I be doing all these things because I'm the mum? The mum is supposed to be the one who does everything, who complains about everything all the time because she's so put upon. But if you can just work out what arrangement you actually want in your own family and put that into place. And you can't always control what your partner will want to do or not want to do. But I think it's good to have a dialogue about it and just make sure that you're not just taking all these things on by default. Yeah, my top tip is like enforce that like and don't make it optional. <laughs> So, yeah. because we had this really difficult start with having a baby that um, just cried, um, I found it extremely hard to handle, um, and I'm used to babies, and I understand why they cry, and I know that they're not doing it on purpose. I've learned all of these things through stuff I've observed for 10 years. Um, so we were in the boat where we were like, right, I'm just going to hold on to the baby because I can tell that you are losing it, and you just got to do whatever you need to do to protect your situation. Mm -hmm. But that's left us in a position where now sometimes it can be very hard to get the other person involved again because they're used to doing everything. So I can recommend mm -hmm. that from early on, you are very clear on who does what and you just enforce it <laughs> and you just roll with that. So like I managed to go away a couple of, was it a couple of months ago already? I went to the yeah. US for a few days um, 
which seems like a lifetime ago by now, but, um, and I kind of just said, like, I, I really want to go, so we're going to have to make some kind of plan on how we can, how we can make that happen, so in the end, it worked out perfectly fine, and I just left them here, and they came back, and he still got his head, two arms, and two legs on, so, you know, I'm not <laughs> going to complain about it, I'm like, whatever you guys, you know, just do what you need to do, but, it's funny that responsibility never leaves you. Even when you're abroad, you get text messages alongside the lines of what time should, should he be going to bed? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think actually that's a really good response. If, um, if your partner, you know, I, I love my husband, he's completely wonderful. But if he kind of, if he asks a question like that, where, where one of us needs to make a decision, then often I just say, well, I don't know. What do you think? Because, it's important that they get used to making these decisions as well. So otherwise everything operates out of your brain all the time. And you're like, oh, okay, so their routine is this, this, and this. You both have to know what the routine is. You both have to be able to step in or out at any point because otherwise it's too much on, on one partner and you're not sharing that responsibility. Because actually it's, it's good for the child if both parents are really involved. Like being <clears throat> a hands-on dad is so important, I think. And that, that is the hardest thing. It's that responsibility that always weighs on your brain. It's like you cannot switch that off. You, you can switch off your laptop and leave the business, but you can't switch off the baby and just put it in a corner. So I'm afraid that that responsibility just kind of is always there. And having somebody else that helps you to make you know joint decisions, it truly works wonders. So yeah, really important. So what would you say would be your parting tip to anyone? Your top tip for surviving business and baby I think probably two things have a really clear idea of what you want to achieve in your business and get really clear with yourself about the goals that you have for your business that year and how you're going to make it happen so the what and the how are just so crucial for for having a really strong business I found actually it did me so much good to just have a year where it's all about the delivery and I wasn't really thinking about I'm going to you know roll out this program this week and do something else the next week mm -hmm. it was really really helpful for my business to just really have to focus in it gave me so much clarity on my ideal client it gave me so much clarity on my core offerings it's really been a good thing for my business so try and use it as an opportunity it's almost like a sabbatical where you're just you're thinking big picture in a way but you're just not doing very much and yeah. so you have to pause and get that focus Second thing is just keep a sense of humor about the whole thing. Like when the baby poos over the wall, that is actually funny. It doesn't feel like <laughs> it at the time. When they throw up on your face, you don't love it at the time, but actually you will remember that your whole life about this particular season where you're just like, oh gosh, yeah, the things that things that we have been through. Mm. But um, there are so many lovely moments. And I think if, if you're just super focused on having, you know, the perfect solution and making the baby work, you know, it's, it's not going to be an enjoyable experience. So just take, take, the opportunity to enjoy that season of life. It's its exhausting, it's messy, it will, it will test you to the absolute limits of what you've ever been through in your life probably, but actually that's a good thing for you. It's really good for us to grow in this way. It's really good, for, like I look back on the last five years of my life and I just think, I just feel like a different person. It's really made me into someone that I didn't realize I was before. So see it all as this is what, this is what happens to women when they have children and when they do a business. It's all about growth. And it's a really positive thing. And you feel that pain of that growth, don't you? Oh, my goodness, you do. But, like, I think just be ready to laugh at it because there's so many things that happen every day. You know, wait till you have a toddler who you go into church and he shouts, what's that stink? And you just think, please don't shout that in public. It's so embarrassing. But it's just so funny at the same time. You know, it's, it's all things like that. Just enjoy it and yeah. make the most of the season. It, it doesn't last forever. And once it's gone, it's, it's over. So... Yeah, I think that's that's very true, and I mean, there's just there's just always going to be something that that's happening, right? Like Jack had a habit of pooing on camera for like three months, so every time I was in a meeting, he'd be nicely quietly sitting on your lap, and then suddenly out of nowhere, he just goes, Ugh. and I'm like, yep, that's the baby just doing his thing. I'm just like, right, let's go live, and I'm like, right, hi everyone, the baby's sleeping. Three seconds later, he's awake, and then he's like. Ugh. I'm like, oh, here we go again. It's like, what? So, so these are just things that, that you can only laugh about, right? It's like, you've got no yeah. control over it. You, you are not going to stop this. So, And it's relatable. Like other people with kids out there, they're like, that happens to me all the time as well. And it gives people something to laugh at as well. So I think <laughs> if you can be the leader in that and just be like, so I'm trying to do this today and my baby keeps pooping. Yeah. 
you know that I think that instantly it makes you a lot more kind of approachable doesn't it because people see that actually you're a real person just like everyone we all have these things that happen and you can't control them like I was saying to you yesterday wasn't I we found out two weeks ago that our nursery is closing major panic but actually it's all got sorted it's just you know added a lot onto the to-do list for that time when we were trying mm. to figure it out and you know stress levels were high and I had my perfect plan mapped out for September when my son starts school and then my yeah. other son will be in nursery and I'll have my my walking route all mapped out that's all gone to pot but like yeah. that's what happens isn't it that's the reality and it, that, that's just what it is and sometimes like if you have clients that can't deal with it I had I had a couple of clients that from day one when they knew I was going to have a baby they were really struggling with that idea um they didn't like it um and yeah things took longer to get done mm. yeah I have forgotten things on the odd occasion which is not like you know my standard way of doing things but like there's one thing about pointing it out and then there is something about like just wanting to like actually like lay mm. into you and if mm. you have people that you yeah, that you have been working with and this is the experience that you have then you may need to think about whether they're your ideal client now or not and I do think your personality significantly changes when something like that in your life happens like mm. I, I said a little while ago that I always tested as um, ESFP on the Myers-Briggs and now I test as ENFP and have done consistently for a year mm. and they're not supposed to change right so these things yeah. are perfect this is supposed to stick with you your entire life but it's not I think it was when when you asked us to do the test actually in the group that I did it and I was like no this result is wrong like this it's is wrong it. yeah but yeah it's basically it does change you and sometimes that means that who you want to work with now changes mm. or your mission changes or how you want to do things changes and that's okay too just go with the flow I guess yeah um, so yeah okay well we've been at it for ages now so um, if people want to find out more about you and get any kind of tips support help where would you like to send them um, so I have a Facebook page where you can find out more about my business. That is Jessica Fernley Business Consultant. I also have um, a little quiz called What Stage Is My Business At? Um, which I think there's going to be a link for that somewhere. Is there, Jess? Yeah, I'm going to put the link up. I've got it. And it's, it's a really good quiz. So do take it. Yeah, and if you like the quiz, there's a recorded masterclass that follows on from that where you can um, dive a bit deeper into the stages of business that I've observed while I've been a coach and in my career as well. Um, and yeah, if you like that, then there's more, more on there about how you can find out more about working with me. Yeah, sounds good. Well, thank you so much for coming to join us. Um, it's been really interesting to um, talk about the not so glamorous um, side of being a parent and trying to run a business. Um, but I'm pretty sure we're all doing well and I have faith that everyone else will do well. And I'm sure April will do well too. So I have Yeah, and it's so. like everything, it's, it's that adjustment, isn't it? And yeah. I don't know. It's brilliant fun. I wouldn't change anything about the last five years of my life. It's just been it's been fantastic. But um, yeah, like brilliant learning experience, growing experience, and yeah, yeah, huge, isn't it? I'm seriously learning that adulting is necessary. Like, you have to yeah. be the adult now here. I'm like, no, <laughs> but <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. So you, you do learn and you do grow, and that's part of the process. Everything is um, just that process of learning all the time every day so okie dokes so what we're going to do is i want to say thanks everyone for being here if you are watching the replay later on you want to have any other questions pop the questions um under the video and we'll get back to you we're always there to kind of check in as well anyways um and then i'll be editing the lovely um video it'll go out on the blog and you'll get a link to it via email tomorrow as well and i'm going to put all of jessica's links underneath it um, if you want to connect and then we will see you all again next week same time so it's going to be Wednesday um, 20th of June also 8 a.m. Eastern 1 p.m. Um, BST and um, with Ali Björk and we're going to be talking about how she works 20 hours a week and she's not you know she's not going over that because she's learned that that's her top priority she's not doing any more and um, she's also got three little ones so um yeah she knows about juggling all the things and then there's a change in date for the week after where we're going to be talking to sarah shuttle about um balancing your mental health with your business and but that's going to be on the tuesday rather than the wednesday so um i'll see you all around for that then and i hope you enjoy the rest of this day we've got work to do <laughs> <laughs> i'll talk to you all later bye